Makeblock have sent me their latest and greatest diode laser, the D1 Pro, for review. Standard disclaimer here, I'm not being paid for this review, and Makeblock won't be seeing the video before it's published. I get to keep the machine, but I can also say nasty things about it if I want. Neat. This is the 20 watt model in golden red, or Iron Man colors, I guess. It also comes in a more traditional metal gray. They've also sent me the air assist pump and the RA2 Pro rotary access. What a mouthful. I'm gonna divide this review into a few sections. Check the description below to jump to the chapter markers that are relevant to you. Let's start with the boring stuff first, assembly and safety. I lied, let's burninate some stuff. I'm using a test file I made using a generator that produces light burn files. I can use this test pattern on any new material to get an idea of what power and speed combinations I need for each material. Power and speed are the two main variables for lasers. Increasing in power means that you can get the same result while going faster. At 20 watt optical output, the D1 Pro is currently the highest power diode laser on the market, so it's much less of just an engraver because it can cut too. First up is some 3.5 millimeter plywood or a heavy eighth of an inch. One of the best features of the D1 Pro is the easy focusing. Drop the little arm out, loosen a bolt, raise and lower the whole laser unit until the arm touches the material, tighten the screw, flip the arm up and you're done. This go no go system makes focusing so quick and easy. Next up is some 6mm Baltic birch plywood. Those files are burnt, so what do the results tell us? If we look at the 3.5mm plywood first, we can see the engraving was no issue. If anything, I should have been cranking the speed up faster. 9,000mm per minute at full power was engraving about 0.7mm deep. Cutting was also straightforward. At 50% power, it'll cut as quick as 350mm per minute, and at full power, 550mm per minute was no trouble. You can see that the older lasers at less than 10 watts would have had to go so much slower to cut through. If we look at the birch sample, we can see a big difference. These are different woods, but the key difference is really that the birch is twice as thick. Engraving, again, no issue. Actually more of a range of colors as this material burns a little bit better. Cutting is where we start to run into issues. None of the single pass tests cut all the way through, so you'd have to go even slower than 150 millimeters per minute. The two extra squares I cut afterwards doing two and three passes at 250 millimeters per minute at full power. I believe the glue density in Baltic Birch makes the laser a little bit less effective, but you'll need to balance the power, speed, and how many passes you do for the thickness of the material. You could absolutely use this for template cutting and jigs if you're using three millimeter plywood. If you need to step it up to six millimeters, it can do it. You'll just need to do multiple passes and or go slower. I don't want to just use this for templates. So I want to try something else a little bit more interesting like marquetry. Commercial veneer is typically around 0.8 millimeters thick. So unlike cutting plywood, we can go plenty fast. An interesting effect of optical physics is how different color material absorbs light at different rates. I found that darker veneers cut through at one setting, but light materials had an onion skin left behind. The foolproof solution I went with was two passes at half power at roughly 2,500 millimeters per minute. I could likely dial that setting in more, but I wanted to get a move on for this review. The first background I cut out, I accidentally used the wrong vector line. So it resulted in the cutout being about two millimeters larger than it should have been. Second one, much better fit, though I still need to properly account for the kerf. I just haven't done that yet. There are online generators for generating test patterns to figure all that out. I just haven't got that yet. It's a pretty good result, but for marquetry, it could be a little bit tighter. The possibilities of this are really exciting to me though. I think I could do a separate video just on laser marquetry, maybe throw in some light engraving for stone inlay too. In the past, I've assembled a couple of CNC routers, 3D printers, and years ago I even assembled a small diode laser. So I'm no stranger to how awful assembling these types of machines can really be. I do have to admit though, I was genuinely and pleasantly surprised at how easy and quick this particular machine was. From start to finish, the whole thing took me about six songs into Blind Guardians at the Edge of Time album, or about 38 minutes. And that's to fully assemble. And that includes setting up and moving the camera and lights around while recording. There are only five parts that really need to be assembled, the four frame pieces, and then the X-axis gantry. Everything else is just plugging cables in and zip ties. 
You'll need just one included hex key, which wasn't terrible quality, and a pair of scissors that aren't included. The instructions were also top notch. I think the only machine assembly instructions I've come across that are of a similar quality would probably be Sawstop's legendary assembly guides. I've had machine tool stands that have had worse instructions and taken longer to build. As with all lasers, diode, CO2, or any other form, you need to take precautions to operate it safely. Wear glasses. This is a pretty no-brainer one, but a laser that can cut through wood will very quickly blind you if it reflects into your eye holes, so wear glasses. The machine ships with what seem like perfectly adequate glasses, but I don't have a way to test it or any other glasses, so I'll have to take them at their word. I bought this second pair because it's a little bit more comfortable. If you do buy your own glasses, you want something that's rated for OD6 or higher that covers the 190 to 540 nanometer wavelength. The OD or optical density number refers to how much of the target wavelength light is let through. The higher the OD, the less light that's let through. The wavelength of the 190 to 540 nanometers is common for covering all diode lasers and is a different wavelength than CO2 lasers. It also has two sensors relating to safety, a flame sensor and a tilt sensor. Unsurprisingly, the flame sensor does what it says on the box. If it detects a flare up because you're moving too slow or using too much power or a combination, it'll stop and very loudly, annoyingly alert you. The tilt sensor is good to have, but I'm actually not sure it'd be applicable. If you bump the machine or tilt the machine, it should detect that and stop cutting. But just don't try and yeet your laser, I guess. There are also limit switches on this model, whereas the previous model didn't have it, which I guess are Hall effect sensors rather than, than mechanical switches. This is good because it means there's nothing to break, and it should also prevent the machine from crashing into itself and damaging itself. On the downside for safety, the D1 Pro doesn't come with any form of fume containment and extraction. No enclosure means that the smoke and fumes just go everywhere. There is a pre-order from them for an enclosure, as well as third-party options available today, but this is an additional cost. While that is unfortunate, the only diode laser I know of that comes with an enclosure is the Emblazer 2, which is less powerful and costs more than twice as much. To be clear though, this is more of a complaint about the safety of all diode lasers, not just the D1 Pro. I'll be sorting out some sort of enclosure in the next few weeks. In the meantime, I'm using my shop air filter combined with a fan and the garage door open when weather permits. And I have an air scrubber inside, making sure that no fumes leak inside the house. Unless you have a full filtration system set up, don't really think about using this inside your house. Xtool have their own software, the Xtool Creative Space, and it's fine. You'll need it to set up the machine to install the latest firmware, change settings on the flame sensor, and set up Wi-Fi, but it also actually works pretty well for basic stuff. It has a pretty user-friendly interface, so if this is your first time using a laser, it'd actually be what I'd recommend to get familiar with the concepts because it does hold your hand a little bit. However, it's not limited to their own software. I've also been trialing Lightburn, which it also works with. Lightburn is a lot more intimidating to get started with, but it gives you more flexibilities and options and cut settings and all of that. It should also work with laser gerbil and other laser software, but I haven't tested those. The rotary axis is a neat little package. I'm surprised at just how solid it is. I half expected a plastic chuck, but it's actually metal throughout most of them. There's a few different accessories to let you hold different things, like rotating rollers, uh, this chuck supports for spherical stuff and these studs that can be used to hold rings and other weird shaped objects. Two sizes of jaws are provided, but they also provide 3D models if you want to 3D print your own jaws or I guess make your own model of that. This will work with other lasers too. You simply unplug the Y axis motor and plug this in instead. Many reviewers will show engraving on tumblers, which it can do and it is a cool thing, but being a woodworker that has a little bit less appeal. I think a very cool use case for it is engraving and personalizing turn objects such as pens. Traditionally this has been something that's had to be outsourced but let's see if we can engrave a pen. To set up the rotary axis I have unplugged the Y axis so that's this axis is now unplugged. This cable goes from the rotary tool to the motherboard main board and that's all you really need to do on the electrical setup is obviously you need to align everything so that it works. 
Uh, and in software, there's a couple of tick boxes and that's honestly all there is to it. So I've got a pen blank here. Uh, it is a quarter inch threaded rod, fits into a standard seven millimeter tube. Seven millimeters is the outer diameter. Uh, and using the three jaw chuck, we can just load that in. I've got the support here. So now I can just set my material uh, height, line this up to the center of the pin and engrave it. If you have the original day one, this is a really good package because apart from the pump, it also includes a nozzle and elbow connector and the laser shield with a hole through it as well as the bracket to hold it, all the hose work together. If you don't have the D1 and you're going straight for the D1 Pro, it's still a decent little pump. It is relatively quiet and its best feature is probably that it doesn't dance around too much because of the weird rubber feet, legs, it reminds me of luggage from Discworld. Air assists on lasers blow away smoke and debris from the cut line, which keeps the lens cleaner, which means it operates better, and reduces charring on the top of the workpiece. You can get cheaper units like fish tank pumps, but they're not wobbling around, not dancing across your bench. It's actually a pretty great feature, so it may actually be worth it. It will cut and engrave wood no problem, but what about non-wood materials, wood adjacent material? Acrylic, yes, if it's not clear. Diode lasers work on the visible spectrum, so it passes through transparent materials like clear acrylic and glass. Opaque is okay, but it is very stinky, so try not to do that without filtration. What about vinyl? Technically, it'll cut it, but please don't do that. Don't cut any plastics or foams that you don't know the actual composition of, because in the case of vinyl, it will release chlorine gas, so don't do that. What about slate? Yeah, it engraves great. If you're making a coffee table, custom engraved slate coasters could be a really nice personalization or branding touch. Probably not gonna cut through it though. What about metal? Some metals like stainless steel will engrave, but forget about cutting anything thicker than 0.05 of a millimeter. The D1 Pro comes in three models, the 5 watt, 10 watt, and the 20 watt model that I have. The only difference between the three is the laser module itself. All include the sensors and faster motors of this generation. For the 5 watt model, it will set you back 570 US dollars, 660 for the 10 watt model, and then it jumps to a pretty hefty 1200 US bucks for the 20 watt model. The 20 watt model is new with just one other, maybe two other companies offering that sort of power. I expect the price of that to come down in the future. If you're planning on doing a lot of cutting through thicker plywood, the 20 watt model is the model to get, but if you're mostly engraving, doing marquetry or less frequent cutting, the 10 watt model is probably the better economical choice. The accessories are on top of that, of course. The air assist comes in at $120. The rotary module is $220. Whether or not you use X tools, air assist or not, you'll want some form of compressed air, so factor that in. I think this is actually a pretty powerful and useful machine. At the full price, it isn't cheap, however it is still significantly less than something like a Glowforge. Diode lasers have come a long way in the last few years, being able to actually cut things rather than just restricted to engraving and having really robust accessories like the air assist or the excellent rotary axis. I think this is the perfect machine for someone who is looking for a laser to enhance what they do in their hobby or business, be that engraving, jig making or things like marketry. However, if you're wanting to create a laser cutting business, then the more powerful and much faster CO2 lasers make much more sense from a time is money type perspective. CO2 lasers are typically measured in millimeters per second in their speeds rather than millimeters per minute. Should you get a laser over a CNC router? That's a tricky question because while they are similar, they end up complementing each other because of what they both excel at and conversely what they aren't so good at. If you're more into doing 3D machining or wanting to cut all the way through more frequently, a CNC router is probably a better choice. But with that comes significantly more noise, a steeper learning curve with feed speeds and bit geometry, and finer detail is often lost with a CNC router. 
You certainly can't do marquetry with a CNC router, the veneer would just explode. They also tend to take up a lot more space than this size laser. I think for me, this laser is about right for what I want to do for robot controlled machines. The footprint is small. Heck, I can even fit it in the drawers under my out feed table. It also lets me add that level of personalization that is otherwise pretty tricky to do by hand. The two major negatives I have for this machine really is just the enclosure, which can be sorted easily enough, and the overall price. I don't think the price is unfair, especially compared to the rest of the market, but it still isn't an insignificant cost once you get up to the 20 watt model. Let me know if you're interested in seeing more content like laser marquetry and exploring that side of this type of machinery. Thanks for watching.